To have a new Africa, it is utmost, it is imperative to uh, unite the African diaspora and uh, the uh, continent. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us on this midweek edition of the program. It is views on the continent on the Pan African television, Afric Media. Today, we are going to look at the role of the African diaspora in reshaping or in shaping Africa's economic trajectory. Uh, that is our focus uh, for today. Debates have been uh, uh, all over Africa on the role or how the African diaspora can influence especially economic development in Africa and of course uh, during the program we are going to be answering also uh, who constitute the African diaspora as uh, stakeholders in Africa continue to push forward or towards face lifting the uh, economies of African state the role of the African diaspora in achieving this milestone has increasingly been on the debate table across the continent. Africa's economic trajectory can largely be redefined if African diaspora are uh, inculcated into the program where they can share knowledge, expertise, and technology and fast track continental development. According to a report, African diasporas can also promote trade and foreign direct investment, create businesses and boost entrepreneurship and transfer new knowledge and skills. Who therefore are the African diaspora? According to the African Union, African diaspora composed of people of African origin living outside the continent irrespective of their citizenship and nationality and who are willing to contribute to the development of the African continent and the building of the African Union it is, however, no doubt that the African diaspora represents a huge reservoir of human and financial capital and an important bridge between itself and the African continent, notwithstanding the feasibility of them practically imparting a development in Africa remains the bone of contention. How, therefore, can the African Union and other stakeholders bridge the gap between the African diaspora and the continents and ensure that they fully participate or they are largely involved in the development of the African continent? You are welcome back. This is Views and the Continent. Uh, what is the role of the African diaspora in spurring uh, economic development in Africa? What are the strategies that stakeholders across Africa can use to ensure full participation of uh, people of African descent and not living or residing in Africa to make themselves part of Africa's uh, uh, success story, reshaping a uh, new Africa, and of course, redefining Africa's economic trajectory. Uh, welcome again. If you are just joining, this is Views on the uh, Continent. It is time for us to uncover the panel, and uh, with delight, uh, I would love to introduce to you uh, the two gentlemen uh, present today to give insight on this very uh, special topic uh, uh, the role of the african diaspora who is uh, uh, or who constitute the african diaspora and what are the challenges of african diaspora investing in africa some of the questions that we are going to answer in the course of the uh, informative program views and the continent. Uh, I tell delight to introduce uh, Mr. Elijah Enwaku, researcher with Lix University on African Development. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for making it count this day. Hello to you, uh, viewers of uh, Afrique Media, and hello to you, Clarice, and hello to you, my co-panelists. 
hopefully we can have some fruitful discussion today on this very, very, very vital topic about um, African diaspora and also suggest some way forward for African development and African leaders. And um, hopefully we can have a fruitful discussion. Thanks for having me. Indeed, I'm looking forward to having a fruitful discussion uh, that will push uh, those concerned uh, to make themselves part of Africa. Like uh, President Paul Kagame will always say, no matter where you are, never forget that you are an African. It is time for the African diaspora, or it is time to reunite the African diaspora and, of course, the continent Africa. Uh, with pleasure, we are going to Nigeria, meeting for the first time Mr. Olani Olumayowa. He's a researcher joining the discussion today on the role of the African diaspora in shaping Africa's economic development. Hello to you, sir. It's a pleasure having you on the Pan-African television. Yeah, the pleasure is mine, and thank you so much for inviting me over to discuss this very important issue. Um, like um, Elijah just mentioned, we hope that at the end of today's discussion, we have um, a pathway uh, to development in Africa and uh, leveraging on on the strength of the African diasporans across the globe. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, it is indeed, uh, uh, it's going to be a constructive uh, uh, discussion uh, that uh, will impact uh, people not only in Africa but uh, around the world at large. Coming, this topic coming at a time when Africa is defining a new face for the continent. Uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Elijah. Let's, before we look at the role of the African diaspora in ensuring development in Africa, let's understand understand who an African diaspora is before getting to know what they have to do to spur development across Africa? That's a very critical question because a lot of people have a very lot, uh, some, a little bit of a casual definition of who a diaspora is. You think somebody who's in Europe or who's in North America or in the Americas is the diaspora. No. As long as you've left your country of origin and you've gone to a different country, it could be in Africa. If I was in Nigeria today, I would be a diaspora. If you are in Burkina Faso, you are a diaspora. You are there because you want to either looking for greener pastures. You could be there for different reasons. But the fact that you've left your country of origin, where you have your expertise, where you are trained and whatsoever, and you are in a different country, you are a diaspora. It's as simple as that. So you don't have to necessarily be in the Western part of the world to be considered as a diasporian. You are a diaspora, a diasporian because you are out of your country of origin. It's simple as that. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Inaku. Uh, coming to you, uh, uh, Mr. Olani, uh, let's get your own perspective uh, of who an African diaspora is. Yeah, I, I think, thank you so much, yeah. So I think I think it's to leverage and to build on uh, what Elijah just mentioned, uh, right? And um, at the beginning of this of your show, you have actually did us a very great favor by uh, telling us the definition that the African Union gave to um, African diaspora. And there's one key thing, aside from just about the uh, leaving the place of origin, um, which Elijah has mentioned, and that's 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 a dynamic that a lot of people don't really talk about. And it's the fact that at some point, um, it could be within the space of Africa and it could be outside. More importantly, within the definition that was provided by African Union is the fact that there is a willingness, that there is a willingness to contribute to development. Uh, so it's not just about leaving your place of origin one. It's not just about staying in another place uh, aside from your country of origin. It's the willingness of that individual uh, to contribute to development. That, that, for me, within the framework of the definition provided by African Union, uh, sparks a lot of um, interesting things that we need to explore. So you can actually be outside of your country and yet not, according to this definition, not be uh, a diaspora. Because you are not, uh, there is no willingness or willfulness to want to contribute to development. Uh, that means there's, of course, I believe that that's one of the things that we'll be discussing as we go forward. Uh, that means that you, there's nothing like remittance or DDI or anything 
And that means whatever you have is just solely for that place, uh, following the definition provided by, uh, by African Union. So I, I, I believe, uh, more importantly, that this conversation around African diasporans um, with the framework that the African Union has provided uh, gives us uh, another perspective, a whole new perspective to this entire conversation to also explore and to understand that it's more than just leaving your country, but the willingness for you to contribute and participate in the development uh, of Africa. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, uh, it, it is imperative uh, to participate in the development of uh, one's uh, country, uh, of continent Africa. Uh, Mr. Elijah, uh, so, uh, now, I haven't defined who an African diaspora is, so now let's answer the question which is a topic. What role do you think an African diaspora uh, can, how can they uh, contribute their own quarter to the, 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 the building of the African continent in a contemporary society? We know that the African Union, like we heard in the preamble, has defined the, the, the African diaspora and highlighted some areas where they can be very useful to the continent and, uh, and to the African uh, uh, number one institution, the African Union as a whole. So what role do you think the, the, the African diaspora of the 21st century can play to, sh to, to, to reshape Africa's economic trajectory? Um, let me throw some numbers behind this because sometimes when we talk, uh, it might look a little bit abstract, but when you deal with numbers, people begin to put things into perspective. There is a report by the World Bank Economic Forum in conjunction with a lot of uh, African diaspora that has come out to elucidate the capacity of African diaspora. If somebody is willing, you just type African diaspora slash the World Bank. It's a report that is produced, you know, funded by the World Bank, but it's not entirely produced by the World Bank. It's produced by African diaspora. Uh, let me just be honest that majority of them are those who are here in North America. Those are those who contribute. There are a couple of them in Europe as well, but not many in Africa that contributed to that report. And that report estimated that the capital investment of African diaspora outside of Africa is in the neighborhood of $53 billion. Just imagine that, that African diaspora are investing $53 billion every year into different economies. Then we're not talking about their own money being, I mean, investment in Africa, investment wherever they are, $53 billion. This is colossal. Not only that, between 2004, if I remember very well, between 2004, 2010, African diaspora remitted I mean, talking about money that is sent back on in terms of, I don't know if it was investment or to family or whatever, they remitted something in the neighborhood of 40 million, no, $40 billion to Africa. That's colossal amount of money. That's colossal amount of investment. Now, to come back to your question, I'm trying to throw some numbers there so that when we are discussing or whoever is listening to us can understand the capacity, the potential of African diaspora, what they possess out there, before you even talk about what they can bring back to Africa. This is a huge potential. We have just talked about the investment potential that they have. We have not even talked about, because the report did not go into the intellectual capacity, because that is a number that you cannot actually put a value on it, the intellectual capacity of somebody. But in terms of how many are they, the report came out with a number that says, if you talk between, if you take medical doctors, you take nurses, you take engineers, for instance, Africa has close to, you know, they took um, Zimbabwe was a case study and Ghana was a case study. They said more than 60% of Zimbabweans that are outside of the country are either medical doctors, nurses, or engineers. 
Then the case of Ghana was also taken because they couldn't go all over the whole of Africa. They just took a couple of countries to do analysis that you can actually extrapolate. They took Ghana, for example. They said the medical doctors that Ghana produce, more than 50% of those medical doctors finally relocate out of the country and they are offering their services to other countries. 50%. 50%, we're not talking about 10% of 15, 50% of Ghanaian trained, educated, shaped medical doctors are out of the country. Now, when you put these things, I'm throwing these numbers there so that whoever's listening to us can understand the colossal loss that Africa is having in terms of intellectual property, intellectual dream, in terms of investment dream, in terms of human resource drain, in terms of technological drain, in terms of you can name them. Now, to come back to your answer question now, when we lay down this groundwork, that is potential that would have been invested in the continent of Africa. It is colossal. It is colossal. And if you talk about intellectual uh, investment, I will give you an example because we're talking about numbers here. South Korea, um, India, and um, Japan, they are what they are today because the country enacted a program that said, when we send you out, whether it's the government that's sending you out, whether it's on private basis, whether it's on family basis, whether it's an NGO, when we send you out, when you are coming back, Make sure that you come back with a chip. A chip is a memory chip. That's it. Everything you have learned there, put it on a chip, bring it back home, start something that will say, we are going to, and, and they facilitated everything for these people to come back and invest this knowledge back into their country. If you look at these countries as we speak, I'm telling you this. Let me give you another figure. In 1972, United Nations Development Index rank Nigeria, South, um, South Korea, Malaysia on the same development index, on the same development index, whether it was um, intellectually, whether it was education, they have, they have a lot of indices that they use not to rank countries. Every metrics that they use, these countries that I mentioned in Africa, they were at the same level now, fast forward 20 years after that, or 20 something years, go back to South Korea, go back to Malaysia, go back to Nigeria, and go back to some of these African countries and do the same comparison 30 years down the line. We have huge number of Africans rushing to these countries to go and study or go and look for greener pastures, which means that something is going on. Why these countries were you know, harvesting the product of their own um, um, diaspora, coming back to their country and investing and bringing all that knowledge and everything, the African countries were doing the opposite. Other the people, you know, this is something we're going to discuss. What is it that is causing these African diasporas, me inclusive, what's causing them not to return home and invest in the economies of their country? Is it that they just love the easy life here? Or is it that there is something in their own country of origin that is hindering them not to return? So we're going to be talking about that. But again, I just wanted to lay the ground with that. It is a colossal capacity that we are talking about. Whether you're talking about investment, capital market, international trades, intellectual property, at whatever dimension you're mentioning, African diaspora is a colossal asset to the continent. And hopefully, hopefully we can come back to this and see how the continent of Africa can harness these resources. Is data there is need for the African continent to harness the potentials of, of African descent who are not based on the continent to see how they can bring their expertise to push through a, a development of the African continent. Uh, let me come to you, uh, uh, Mr. Olani. Uh, we've listened to Mr. Enoko detailedly giving statistics uh, of uh, the uh, African diaspora, how they the contribute to the development of other 
countries and then when you look at it so we're asking this question yeah uh, uh, the, the, there has been this urge uh, in, in, in present day society to reunite the African diaspora and the continent so with with all of this what do you think uh, uh, can be done to, to bring uh, this very I will say a, a, a very uh, important asset assets to, of the continent together to, 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 to see how they can boost development in Africa? I, I, I think before we start to talk about that, we need to first understand, and he has actually led us into that, I think we need to first talk about uh, the why, you know, the brain drain that we have in not just in one of the countries, all of Africa, the brain drain that we have. We need to first talk about that before we talk about what we need to do to get things right and to make them come back. You know, So I, I think it's very imperative for us to understand that the environment that we found ourselves here in this part of the world would not want to encourage most people to even come back. And I so, thank you, Elijah, for even using yourself as an example of someone who has gone out and has not returned, you know. But it's one of the, it's, you are just one of the very so many that we have outside of the shores of Africa who has left and has not returned. And, and it's not far fetched. We all can see what is happening in, in the entire, let me use Nigeria for instance. The uncertainty, the economic uncertainty that we have in the country is enough to make anybody run away, you know? And when you talk about insecurity, the high level of insecurity, where expatriates, uh, where investors, uh, kidnapped almost on a daily basis and government has no answer or solution to it, then it becomes very problematic or challenging for anybody to want to come back to Africa to make investment. And I think it's one thing that we need to talk about. So we, we before we go into what African nation or the African Union or each country uh, needs to do, we need to understand this, this very huge, huge problem in front of us. And it's it's not something that just started now. You have used Nigeria, who at some point around the 1970s was on the same level with South Korea and Malaysia. And now you can compare the two. Uh, as of 2017 or thereabout, I think 2017 or so, uh, there was a report that over 7.2 million, did I say 2017? I think around 20, uh, 2008 that there, there's a report that over 7.2 million Africans are in just just the OECD members, member countries. That's where you find a 7.2. So fast forward to 2022, what do you think will be the number? I can tell you categorically that uh, recently, there's a new syndrome in Nigeria. It is called JAPA. It's a local, um, in a local parlance, it means uh, your, your ability to run away, just run away. So almost every african nigerian youth wants to jack up wants to run away they are not ready to stay within the country yeah. and so so when you talk about investment you talk about brain drain you talk about human resource human human the intellectual capacity of africans we are losing it on a daily basis so instead of getting this investment or this return back into africa we are actually losing more because we have a lot of african youths who are looking for greener pasture? Greener pasture, my dear, is a greener spot. Is a greener pasture. They would rather want to go to Canada, for instance, or any of the North American, or go to Europe to have a life because there's nothing. You can imagine the number of graduates that Nigeria turn out on a yearly basis, and no job employment for them. What do you expect them to do? They have to leave the country and go to where they know that they have a promise, a hope, a life. And again, since February this year, uh, February 2022, uh, the Academic Staff Union of Universities have been on strike in Nigeria, so they've not been um, university education, especially for government schools. So that means you have a whole lot of African uh, Nigerian students sitting at home. So what do you expect them to do? They look for any avenue to JAPA. I'm using that phrase, JAPA, they want to run. I have colleagues that have left the country because they can't just cope with what is happening in the country. So even before we start to talk about returning, we need to first mitigate why they are leaving. When we can stop why people leave, then we can talk about how they can come back. Or 
Elijah has actually through he has thrown up so many uh, serious issues. Uh, and then um, you mentioned South Korea um, and the idea of bringing technological advancement back into their country. How many, how many, how many Africans will be ready to bring, you know, because of so many, the high level of corruption in Africa, who do you think wants to leave his business that he knows that if he starts in somewhere like Canada, it is going to thrive and it's going to get big and it's going to get his return on investment? Who do you think will want to leave that for the uncertainty in Africa? We've been reading about Burkina Faso for, for a while and all the cool and all the rest that is happening, the unrest happening in that country. So imagine someone in that space, someone from that country. Do you think that person wants to come back home to invest? Invest what? Go into where? So these are the questions. If we don't plug in all of these loopholes, all of these challenges, if we don't solve all of these challenges that are actually pushing people away, we can't be talking about asking them to come back to invest. So we need to first deal with our own local problem within the space, within the continent, before we talk about diasporans who need to come back to invest. You can't stay outside of, outside of Nigeria and you've made, you've worked all your life, you've gathered a lot of money and you want to invest in an economy that is very uncertain where uh, the fluctuation and the, the struggle between Naira and dollar is almost unpredictable every blessed day. As of today, uh, a pound, I was told, is, is going for like 890 Naira at exchange at parallel market. So you can imagine that. Do you want to bring such investment, your idea, back to a country where you have economic uncertainty? I don't think that is going to be the wisest thing to, uh, thing to do. So I think we need to first discuss and trash out all of these issues. We need to plug all of these holes before we start to talk about um, uh, African diaspora coming back to invest. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh... And just to remind our viewers joining us that this is Views on the Continent and we are discussing something very important, the role of the African diaspora in uh, spurring economic development in Africa. What are the challenges uh, faced by the African diaspora? Why don't they uh, uh, return to, to carry out uh, investment? That is uh, the question and some that we are going to answer or that we have started answering as uh, the, the program is uh, unfolding. You can follow us live on Afric Media TV. You can leave your comment on, uh, on the live, uh, under the live show. So coming back to, to, to our guest, uh, Mr. Enwako, uh, we have listened carefully uh, to, to, to your analysis and uh, those of your co uh, regarding uh, the African diaspora, what they bring to the world at large, but then uh, still seeing a lack to the African continent. Now let's try to, to, to understand uh, what could be the root cause. What is that thing that is uh, stopping people who have traveled, who have learned? We, we heard in the preamble that the, the African diaspora represent a huge reservoir it's a reservoir of knowledge of finances but then what is that thing that is impeding their return to africa especially uh, coming to invest hey i'm going to answer your question in two parts i just want to pick up on what mr olani um mentioned and then i'll come back to the to the diaspora what's hindering them i want to start from home um i want to expand on something mr olani said that um every youth um, want to leave Africa. It's even worse than that, my brother. Even those who are well settled in Africa, I'm talking about people who have good jobs in Africa, they still, they still want to leave as well. So it's more than just, you know, people who don't have. There is something beyond people who don't have. Um, I talked to somebody who graduated from teacher's college uh, in Cameroon. I was talking to that person in Cameroon and I was advising that person that if you have a good steady job, you can plan, you know, I was trying to strategize with her and see how she can make a good living. But all her mind was that she wanted to go out of the country. When I tried to influence her, she was like, oh, I'm trying to deprive. I'm not telling her the truth of what's happening here. I'm trying to deprive her. So there is a mentality issue. Number two, you also have the media. The media in Africa, it's not showing the positive or what is, let me just say positive, the capacity of what Africa is capable of doing. 
we are not portraying that. We are allowing foreign media to come into the continent and begin to portray only the negative part of Africa. It's a problem. And with that negativity, nobody seems to see the potential in Africa. Even when you're talking to somebody who is in Africa, you're trying to point out to them that, look, with what you currently have at the moment, with the job and everything that you have, you can make it better in Africa than if you come over here. They will feel that, oh, this guy is just trying to, you know, he doesn't want to tell us the truth of what's happening over there. He's just trying to blackmail us. He doesn't want us to come over there. But you're telling them the truth because I am been in Africa and I'm here and I can compare the two and I can tell them. So it goes beyond that. There's a mentality issue. But now let's come back to the political aspect as well, because this is very critical. African government, you know, they are very quick to see give a definition of who a diaspora are to include willingness as if somebody is there, he wanted, he was just born to leave his country and stay out and never want to come back. That is a political speech. I did not see in that preamble their own responsibility for creating a climate, a very hostile climate like my good brother there, Olalini, already mentioned. They didn't mention that in the preamble, that the political climate back home is very hostile, very, very hostile in a way that even you, a diaspora who is here, you're being considered as an enemy in your own country because you're abroad. How many countries in Africa? have rejected dual citizenship because they are afraid that if you give dual citizenship to their own people who are abroad, maybe they'll come back home and they begin to carry out political upheavals or whatnot. Therefore, they say that if you obtain citizenship of a different country, you lose the citizenship of the own country that you are born. That is a hindrance. The few countries in Africa that have been able to you know, institute something like a dual citizenship where you can I always run home anytime and invest. If, imagine that you invest a business back home and you have people that are controlling it. It's going to take you one month to get a visa to go to your own home, home country. It's very pain. It's very painful. I have a lot of friends here who cannot even go back home because they're being prosecuted in their own country of origin because if they put lay their, you know, step their feet in their country of origin, they're going to be put in jail. Not because of anything they have done, just because of their own opinion of what they think the country should run ahead. They're being considered as enemies in their own country. But at the same time, those are the people that are giving a definition of a diaspora as somebody that is willing to come back home and invest in their country. Let me tell you, every person that, every diaspora that I have spoken to, because this is my area of research, I talk to people and see how can we develop Africa? Every single person that I've spoken to wants to go back home and invest because they've seen the potential. You know, my brother there mentioned um, currency disparity. It's not actually a bad thing all the time, my good brother. It's not actually a bad thing because if I'm here and I see that the currency in Nigeria, you know, has depreciated vis-a-vis -vis the visa, I mean, at the dollar, I would be willing to go back and invest because my exchange rate is going to be higher. I'm going to make more money by exchanging into Nigerian currency. So I'll be willing to go back home and invest because it's advantageous for me. So it's not always a bad thing all the time. But again, is the environment suitable, just like you mentioned, is the environment suitable for diaspora to come back home? You have people who want to go back home and invest, but you have war. You, you uh, Clarice, you are in Cameroon as we speak now. We, I have people in Cameroon that have lost every investment they invested in the Northwest and the South because of the war that's going on there. You tell me that, that you're going to, in, in, I mean, convince that individual to go back home and invest again when he has just invested and he has lost everything in the war? Of course not, he's not going to do that. So the government that be, instead of making political definition of who a diaspora is supposed to be, should put their house in order in Africa and create an enabling environment for these people to come and invest. I talked, I spoke to an organization, it's an organization of African doc doctors in the diaspora, because as I said, this is my area of research. I go talk to them and find out how can we go back home? How, what should they do? Because the United Nations uh, and UNESCO was trying to talk to them, see how they could go back to Africa and help those local doctors when it comes to uh, the pandemic and COVID and all whatnot. These people outline a couple of things that is hindering them. Number one, even when they want to offer their services for free, I'm talking about medical doctors that want to offer their services for free, the government in their country is not even able to guarantee taking care of their lodging to lodge them. 
These people are coming for free. You can't even afford to lodge them and have a place for them to stay and take care of their servants. So how do you want them to do? They have to use their own private finances. They have to come for free and everything is on their own and offer service for free. It's not like that. It doesn't work like that. That's the number one complaint. Number two complaint is what my brother already mentioned there, insecurity. A lot of them are afraid that immediately people hear that they are back in their country, either it's going to be kidnapping, it's going to be one thing or the other, or those who are politically inclined, they're going to be prosecuted by their government for, you know, standing against them or whatever it is. So there are so many things that the government in Africa needs to put in place to attract diaspora investment. I forgot to mention this, because this is one thing that came out with those, you know, other people who are into technology and whatnot. They said, I quote, the economic environment does not favor our investment in Africa. And what do they mean by that? If you talk private and medium-sized enterprises, it takes two weeks if I want to start a company here in Canada or in the United States. It takes two weeks for me to get my permit. But in Africa, it's going to take you months upon months for you to apply to get a permit to practice, I mean, to start a business or whatever it is. Those kind of bottlenecks, not to talk of what my brother already mentioned, kickbacks, you are going to go through bottlenecks, bribery, and corruption, and all whatnot, before you even start the business, and so on. So these governments that are coming out with this political definition should also have a definition of what they should put in order, in order to attract diaspora. So it's a long list of things. Indeed, uh, it is a long list of things. Uh, listening to you, gentlemen, uh, Kinley, uh, I, I'm about to ask uh, the, the, this question uh, that you, you made mention, Mr. Enwako, about the fact that uh, uh, there is no political will or the political environment is not favorable enough for African diaspora to return and uh, invest in their country. Uh, I will not continue this question with you, but then let's uh, go to Nigeria to meet uh, Mr. Olani. Uh, uh, listening to, to the lapses, we have actually identified some challenges. So now, what can this African diaspora do that they are willing, the, the willingness to come back is there? What Therefore, can they practically do to inculcate themselves into the political affairs uh, constructively, constructively of the continent to ensure that uh, th there is a suitable political atmosphere that will enter upon uh, a suitable uh, economic sphere for development or for investment in Africa? Uh, thank you so much. I, I think I think that your question takes us back to what we were discussing earlier. Uh, so, it's one thing to expect from uh, the diasporans, then in that same breath, we need to talk about the responsibility of government to provide the necessary, the en enduring and accommodating environment for diasporans to come back to invest. So, it's, it's taking us back to that same point. But before I go there, Recently, I think a few days ago, there was um, a serious trending news in Nigeria of uh, the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives in Nigeria, who during the plenary, one of the members stood up and was about to read, um, um, what would I call it now, like um, a request by diasporans. Nigerian diasporans, but a native of a particular state, Benue State, in, um, in I think in US or so. And the response of the deputy speaker uh, was that there are no Nigerians. And the reason he said there are no Nigerians is because they are not living in Nigeria. Absolutely. And the interesting thing, the more interesting thing is that no other person, at least within the short clip or the clip that we saw, stood up to challenge him on that and to correct that impression that you can't say these people are not Nigerians because they're not living within the shores of the country. Everybody kept mute. So what that means is that there's a resistance. Uh, you have asked about their incorporation or their interest in politics that can help soften the ground for them for economic investment. But the thing is, there's a huge resistance within government the political sphere doesn't want those people because they have gone outside they've seen some of those things they know how it's done 
they, they know, they demand for a better governance. And they don't want to hear that. These guys don't want to hear it. They don't want them to come back and start asking them questions or probing them. They feel they are challenging their authority. So you can imagine in the plenary, as of red, as of these are lawmakers, and yet it could boldly, boldly on national TV say they are not Nigerians because they don't stay within Nigeria. And so whatever is it, that was their request. So imagine if I wanted to invest in agriculture because Benue State is actually known for agriculture in Nigeria. So imagine I want to invest in whatever value chain of agriculture in Benue State. And I hear the deputy speaker tell me that I'm not a Nigerian because I don't stay in Nigeria. Then that immediately pushed me away from bringing whatever investment I want to bring to my hometown. And that is one of the challenges that we have. Um, I think the political class or the political elite needs to understand that the, 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 the faster they start to work with their aspirants, the better for them in governance. Because they are to help you. They are coming to help you to put some things in place. Uh, he has also mentioned uh, the, the problem of those people coming, especially for doctors who want to come and do free medical service. And yet government expect them to pay to pay them, you have a lot of kickback, a lot of kickback when that when that comes up. It happens a lot in Nigeria. So it becomes a problem for us to actually, actually get anybody interested in investing back in Nigeria or in investing back in Africa because of all of these issues. We need to, or the political class in Africa needs to educate and reorientate their minds to understand that these people outside of their country or outside of the continent are still a nationality of whichever African Union member or state member that they have. They have a role to play in development, and you can't push that away. I, I think we they need to realize that it's a fact, and they need to realize it on time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Olani. Uh, so uh, we, we have listened, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in the start we said uh, we were ensuring or making sure that uh, this uh, program is a constructive one that uh, will go ahead uh, a long way to, to solve this problem of uh, the African diaspora uh, not uh, being engaged in Africa the way they are supposed to be because actually uh, we have had cases where uh, people have come back to their nations to their respective countries and of course they are trying to to, to boost the uh, foreign direct uh, investment uh, let's come back uh, to the political aspect of it uh, i'll continue with you mr Enoku. Uh, uh listening to mr ulani uh, uh, just uh, some few minutes ago he made mention of uh, a statement made by a politician in nigeria of course uh, that is very problematic now uh, the last time I, I, I had this uh, one uh, show that was uh, related to something that we're talking about, and one of the, the speakers, I think Dr. Nick Nguyen, highlighted this. Our politicians, the people we need to put at the helm matter a lot, because such a statement it goes a long way to destroy not only the mindset, but of course the economy of uh, the, a country or the continent because people will not want to invest now so what can we say uh, should maybe the, the best politicians we, we you, you agree with me that there has been a win of change across africa and we see young intellectual africans uh, involving in, uh, themselves in politics so how can we uh, shun bad politics in africa and make sure that uh, uh, politics doesn't stand on the way uh, of uh, the, the development of the continent Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, Clarice, that's the reality. What you mentioned is the reality because, you know, if I come back home and I start a small and medium enterprise company, I'm going to need farm to market roads in order to take my products from the farm to the road. And it's going to be the politicians, the powers that be that have to provide that. I'm not the one to come and build roads in order to take my product from the farm to the market. And if those roads are not there, I'm going to speak up. I'll say, I'll make a statement. I say, I need roads in order to build this. And if the government that be sees that as a threat, 
they're going to stop me from coming because they know that when I don't get roads and I make a statement about roads, they're going to see me as an enemy. But I'm not an enemy. I am a progress builder. I want to see solutions. I'm asking for solutions. I'm asking for good governance. I'm asking for better solutions for the people. I'm not an enemy. So there is this concept in Africa, all of Africa, that when you oppose the government, you're an enemy. It is so terribly entrenched in the minds of African politicians that any opposition leader is, it's, is an enemy. Meanwhile, when you oppose the government, it is because you want good governance. It is because you want a better situation for the country. You want things to be better. Let me give an example, uh, Clarice, because we've been talking about diasporas coming back home to invest and do this and do that. If I'm coming back home to invest in a company that needs electricity, because we are talking about power, we're talking about what is going to produce the goods. Where is the electricity in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in Africa, when you cannot have electricity to charge your phone? And if I don't have those resources, I'm going to speak out. I'm going to say, hey, government, you've called me to come back home. I'm back home. I've come up with this initiative. I need power in order to produce. And if you see me as an enemy, because I'm demanding for something to improve the life of the people, which you were supposed to help me to improve, Africa will be back for the next, I don't know, God forbid that I should mention that, that word. Because these are realities. What my friend mentioned there is a reality. It's not just happening in Nigeria. It's happening in Cameroon. It's happening in Burkina Faso. It's happening all over Africa. You see people who demand for free speech as enemies. That country will not progress. Because if you do not, even in real life, you don't want some, if you don't have somebody that's opposing you, pushing you, making you to, you know, to be better, you will, be, you will maintain the status quo. You're going to be at the same sport for a very long time. In fact, in the Western world in which we are, the opposition and government constitute a formidable force. In fact, it is always well entrenched and encouraged that there should be a formidable opposition to make sure that they are on the toes of the government that is in power. And in fact, if you have a minister of defense, you have a minister of defense in the shadow cabinet of the opposition. If you have a minister of culture, you have a minister of culture in the shadow, shadow, uh, shadow cabinet of the opposition. These people are acting as check and balances the power that be. But it is not the case in Africa. You're being seen as an enemy. And that is a problem. When you don't have free speech, in fact, that's why you're going to consider diaspora because these are people that are coming from countries with free speech, democracy, you express yourself. You, you don't have anybody chasing you because to express yourself, as long as you obey, you do it within the law, you're not holding a gun or anything. Nobody purchases anything. I mean, pursues you anywhere. But in Africa, it is considered like a terror. You're an enemy. So again, go back to your question. Africans should make sure, for example, Nigeria is coming up now with elections. Sometimes there is this misfortune that in Africa, people don't go out to vote for good leaders. They rather go to uh, uh, prayer houses to pray for good leaders. But when it's time to vote for leaders, they don't do it. I call on the people in Nigeria to look at the candidates and vote for the right one. I call for the people in Cameroon. I call for the people in every African country, South Africa, Zimbabwe. When the time comes, go out there and vote. Be involved in the affairs of your nation. Change the system that be. The people in diaspora, including me, we want to come back home and invest, but we need a political climate that is going to be favorable for the things that we want to invest in. I'm not going to come and invest my money like what's happening in most countries, and then when the next day there's war and everything crumbles. And all. Nobody, there is so much risk. Africa must understand, not just from a diaspora perspective, that foreign investment is... I mean, war and uh, unstable uh, political climate is an enemy of investment. Nobody wants to invest his money. It doesn't matter whether you're a diaspora or your international organization, or whoever, nobody wants to invest his money where there's so much risk of losing his capital. Nobody will do that. So African government must create those enabling environment, environments for diaspora and all the other international organizations to come back home and invest. At the time uh, that Africa is uh, looking towards uh, or working uh, towards uh, involving or improving a uh, backyard burden, improving 
trade within Africa, that is to make trade very transparent between uh, African uh, countries. Uh, uh, let's continue in that perspective, uh, Mr. Olani. Uh, what are the best strategies you think uh, African stakeholders, especially uh, political leaders, can put in place to unite uh, the African diaspora and uh, the continent now that uh, they are now conversant, conversant with the role, the importance, or the place of the African diaspora in the development of the continent? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think the first thing um they need to do is to create an enabling encouraging environment the environment uh determines everything um when you talk about environment you talk about power you talk about safety security you talk about um uh, access good uh, road access uh, because these are some of the challenges that we have in africa that would deter uh, an investor whether a diasporan or not, to come back to Africa to invest. Uh, so we need to first sort that out and get that set to, uh, and then, then, then we can talk about the impact that we can, or the benefit that we can accrue from that. So it's very important, first off, that the enabling environment, there was a time that um, the government of Nigeria, I think this very administration of Buhari, uh, came up with um, ease of doing business, um, a presidential order on uh, ease of doing business. Of course, the intention is good, uh, is to ensure that uh, business registration for diasporans or anybody who is coming to invest in Nigeria is seamless. Uh, but of course, we know the bureaucratic bottlenecks uh, that you have to scale through for you to get it, even if the government has made a proclamation. And I, and I think uh, that to a large extent is what is happening. And aside from that, once, even if you are able to surmount that and to solve that problem, then you are faced with your daily activity as a business. Uh, you need power, there's no power. Uh, you need good access road, um, very challenging. Not all the places in Nigeria has good access road. Uh, if you invest your money in agriculture, you need good access road, you need storage facility. Uh, these are some of the challenges that we have. I've mentioned Benue State, one of the states in the north central part of uh, Nigeria, who is uh, blessed with agricultural um, resources, but unfortunately, as zero investment in the value chain of agriculture and that becomes a very huge problem so it, uh, yes if government will play its own part in providing this enabling environment providing electricity then this encourages um, investors their aspirants to come back and invest I, I think the discussion starts from there government needs to play its part um, government cannot abdicate its own responsibility to diasporans to come and do for it. No, it's not possible. The government has a very huge role to play, and government must be seen playing that role. The government must do what it has promised, what it has vowed to do to the electorates. Um, like uh, we have mentioned, the dry is within the period of election. Yes, these politicians will come up and make a lot of promises. They must uh, fulfill a lot of their promises. And that is when you can encourage, because the world there, just like our African Union defined a diaspora as the willingness to contribute to development, I think we need to uh, add another line, a caveat to that, that before you have willingness to contribute, you have responsibility to provide. Uh, the responsibility side goes to government, why then you know that there will be willingness to um, uh, engage in development or to bring investment. So government needs to play its part. I think I think that's the bedrock. It's not that uh, diasporans are not willing to come or they are not ready to come. They are ready to come. Um, my brother just mentioned that. They are ready to come back, but the challenge is what will they meet on ground? Government needs to play its own part, play its own role in ensuring that the conducive environment, atmosphere is there, that there's a sense of safety both economical and uh, physical uh, safety, that when you bring your money, you bring your investment into Africa, you bring your investment to Nigeria, for instance, there is economic safety for you. And there's, there's safety in terms of physical safety. You are not scared or worried about somebody running after you to kidnap you. Exactly. When you have that, it encourages anybody who is outside of the shores of Africa to come back to invest. I, I think it starts with government, yeah. 
Indeed, uh, it starts with a government, but each and everyone has a role to play to see that uh, we bring all the positive factors together to ensure uh, that the continent takes its new feet. A new Africa. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Elijah Enwako, we have uh, actually dwelled much on the lapses of the African government or African politicians and why uh, it is difficult for a diaspora to come back to invest in the country. But then let's look at it. Should the diaspora face the fear or should they uh, maybe uh, stay behind uh, because of the uncertainty uh, that uh, looms ahead? Are you talking about the diasporas coming back home if they should stay back or actually come despite the risk? Yeah, because uh, okay. so, so, some some uh, school of thought will always say life in itself is a risk, and to to be able to to know what awaits you, you need to take that risk. So, what have they been doing? Uh, like I said, not all countries are, are in uh, uh, upheaval, especially political uh, upheavals. So now, what can be done? We know that uh, the, 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 the African diaspora, we said already, is a huge reservoir of knowledge, technology, and everything. You can name the rest. But then, uh, what are they doing, especially at the time that Africa has redefined its developmental agenda? We're talking about the African continent of free trade area that is already there. So how can the African diaspora together with other political actors on the continent willing to work, how can they put forces together to ensure that they fast track or make a clear path for this uh, very historic project for Africa? Okay, let me answer you very clearly. I'm, I'm going to answer with an example. Permit me, give this example. It's a personal example. Okay. I'm originally from British Cameroon. That's Southern Cameroon. That's where I'm originally from. I'm a Cameroonian. I came back home and invested had a company in billion. I mean a million, sorry. Who are listening to me know my story very well. I invested in the Northwest and the Southwest. But because of this war, I lost almost everything. Almost everything as I'm speaking to you. I talk to the powers that be because I know a lot of friends who are in government. Because I've been in radio, TV, both here and back home. I come home every time. I have talked over and over and said the problem in Cameroon is a problem that can easily be solved. I do not think that the both sides came together in order to separate again. No, I think they came together to stay. But one side is complaining that there is a problem. If the government wants to solve this problem tomorrow, they will do it. If they have the country I've had, they will do it. A lot of problems we have in Africa. I gave that one as an example to show you that it is lack of the political will to solve the problem that is an issue. It's not that they cannot. Most African government can solve the problem. It's lack of the political will to solve the problem that is an issue. Whether you talk about farm to market, or whether you talk about this, if we have time, and I dissect for you, how much African governments are paying in terms of money that they pay to service their debt. They are borrowing every single day. But where is this money going for? It's going for wrong reasons. A country like yours, you're in Cameroon. If I tell you how much the government of Cameroon is spending to maintain that war, instead of solving a problem that will resolve it once and for all, there is no political will to solve the problem. You can talk about Nigeria, you can talk about uh, Ivory Coast, you can talk about Ghana, you can talk about everything. The issue is the same. You have people in government who do not have the political will to solve the problem. They know the problems and they are capable of solving that problem. Africans are not morons. These are not people who don't have brains. We've seen examples. Like you, everybody knows about the case of um, Tanzania. That man called uh, Mugufuli, he came to power. It didn't take him five years to turn the country around. There was nothing, there was no miracle that he did. There was nothing extra that he did. He simply made sure that the money that the country is borrowing and the country resources are being channeled to the right course. And he was able to turn that country within five years, five years. Thomas Sankara is another case. 
Pokegami is another case. So it is the lack of political will. If the political will is there to put in place the strategies to resolve the country, diaspora will be back home tomorrow. I will be back home tomorrow to invest all my money. But I'm not going to take a second chance to invest my millions of franc CFA into an economy that is crumbling because I don't know anybody in Yaoundé. I'm, if I'm investing, I'm going to invest either in the Southwest, in the Northwest. That's where I come from. And that is where I'm based. But that's where the war is. So you don't expect me to take all my half and currency, come and invest in a place where I know that everything is going to crumble. Let the power that be show the political goodwill that they are willing to, to solve the problems in their country. I'm telling you, you're going to see diaspora rushing home because they know the potential. They have been there. That's where they were born. That's where they grew up. They know the potential in the country. They are willing to invest. So all those political statements that say that are talking about willing diaspora, it's just a political statement trying to escape from their own responsibility. Like Mr. Olanyi already said, the first issue and the first solution to this problem is put together a politically viable environment that is going to attract not just diaspora because even though we are talking about diaspora you have international organizations that are willing to come to africa because they have seen the resources the manpower is there the human resource is there the intellectual power is there the natural resources are there so not just diaspora this diaspora will be coming but they'll bring together you know international organizations that will be willing to invest in africa and africa will be the you know the el dorado of the world i'm telling you the truth Indeed, indeed, Africa is the cradle of humanity. Uh, it was, uh, of course, an interesting uh, debate that we did not see that uh, time was running faster. Coming to you, uh, to Nigeria, Mr. Olani, can you give us uh, maybe a concluding statement before we end the show regarding our topic for discussion? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, my, my parting words will be, the government needs to do its bit of the bargain. Uh, you can't keep demanding and keep expecting the aspirants or foreign direct investment to improve when you do not provide the basic things that these investors will need to operate. Uh, so as long as we keep going back and forth on the government providing or doing its own part of the deal, it becomes problematic for investors to bring money. Uh, whether it's like he said, whether it's the diasporans or even foreign uh, foreign uh, investors, so we need to get that settled. Government needs to do its bit of the bargain. It's very important. Uh, Agenda 2063 is there. True. Uh, do we have the capacity to achieve that in 2063? I don't know. I can't say yes. I can't say no. But we know that we need to put some things in place. Uh, it's more than, yes, you're laughing, it's true. It's more than just having a framework or a document, it goes to implementation. And if you have not even settled your own people within your own frame of your country, how, how then is it going to be possible for you to actually uh, go outside of your country to connect to other African states? So it becomes very imperative for government to do its part of the deal. They must do their part. When you do your part, you don't need to call investors to come. Like he said, for instance, Nigeria has too many resources, too many resources, human resource, whatever you want to think of, Nigeria has it. And so if, if you can't provide your part of the bargain, you can't expect others to come and do it for you. You have to do yours. Then you will see that the willingness that they had in that definition by African Union will play out itself. You, you, they, they don't even need to put it in that framing. Okay. Diasporans will come back to Africa and just invest because they will see it as a place to invest their money. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, Africa is a very fertile business ground. Like uh, the gentlemen have underlined, it is time for African governments to put in place a serene atmosphere, uh, especially a political atmosphere that will attract uh, foreign direct investment and of course push people of African descent who have well uh, equipped themselves with knowledge and of course and are ready to share their expertise, the technology to see that they participate in uh, the uh, uh, continental economic growth. Uh, this is how we saw it on the, the program but that 
then I want to say immense thank you to Mr. Elijah Enwako, a researcher with Lakes University on African Development, and Mr. Olaniyi Olumayowa, also a researcher for the great insight uh, given uh, regarding the uh, topic for discussion, the role of the diaspora in shaping Africa's trajectory. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being there. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, of course, we say thank you also to the uh, technical crew for uh, ensuring that the program was a success. Why well, I'm going to draw the curtains into this edition of the program this on the continent, but then uh, don't go away. Keep having a lovely moment in the company of our transmissions. I'll be with you again uh, same time tomorrow to talk about issues affecting the global world. Bye-bye for now. Very appreciate all what you are Okay,